Welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, where our job is to help you build visibility, professional credibility, and connection with your ideal client by putting the human at the center of innovative marketing so you can build and strengthen an engaging, enduring relationship with your ideal clients. I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm honored that you're here with me. If you haven't joined our wonderful marketing transformation community yet, go to innovabiz.co and collect your free gift as well. Do subscribe to the show and also leave a review because it helps others find us. Let's get into today's masterclass on this InnovaBuzz podcast. Ideas do get better. Um, through challenge and critique. And uh, if you want to innovate, um, you've got to have a couple of prerequisites. One is I, I would suggest having a psychologically safe workplace where people can throw ideas out there without fear or favour. Um, and you've got, to, you've got to really approach it with a mindset of, of pre-committing to the possibility of being wrong. Welcome back. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. Now, if you haven't yet listened to my recent conversations with Eric Seropian of This Is My South Bay and with Jeff Harry of Rediscover Your Play, then you're in for a treat. Go check them out, but only after you've listened to today's conversation, of course. Now, I'm really excited today to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest, Graham Miller. He's a business resilience consultant. He's a facilitator and an author. Graham has spent over 20 years in the Royal Australian Navy's fleet air arm in aviation and management roles before working in organisational development positions in the public sector. For the past 12 years, he has consulted to organisations both large and small in the areas of organisational resilience and organisational development. He's the co-founder and co-director of Brisbane-based management consultancy Humans Being at Work which encourages people to bring their authentic selves to work and helps organisations tap into the collective wisdom that resides within to build that organisational resilience. Graham has always been fascinated with how people work in organisations and he's merged his aviation background with his consultancy experience to provide him a unique perspective on organisational development. In 2020, Graham published his book, The Human Factor, which outlines how organisations can adapt and adopt the management principles developed in the aviation industry over the past 40 years to boost organisational performance, to reduce error and to get the best from their people to improve that organisational resilience. In our conversation today, Graham talked to me about human leadership and allowing for human factors, taking into account the fallibility that we all have as humans. We talked about the importance of robust systems and how that allows more human connection. And Graham explained why building psychologically safe environments is really critical for innovation. Without further ado, then let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Graham Miller. Hi, I'm your host, Jordan Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited today to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast from Brisbane, Australia, so it's in my time zone, Graham Milne, who's a management consultant. He's a former naval aviator, and he's author of The Human Factor, which outlines how any business or organisation can adopt aviation principles to boost performance, reduce error, and get the best from their people. So welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast, Graham. It's a great privilege to have you as my guest. Thank you very much, Jürgen. Really wonderful to be here. Catherine Lloyd, who was our guest on episode 259 of the InnovaBuzz podcast, suggested that we have a conversation with you, Graham, and she introduced us. So a big hello to Catherine. Absolutely, yeah. Catherine and I 
uh, friends and colleagues. Um, she's obviously Brisbane based as well, and uh, she's a fellow group facilitator, as am I, and uh, so we see each other reasonably regularly. So I appreciate Catherine's mm. lead. That's great. And and she's just, I need to follow up with her. She's just published her new book, hasn't she? She does, yeah, she has. Published? Yes, it's yeah. all about creativity and uh, mm. is, um, I think, right uh, right up your track. And, um, yeah, we, we actually caught up um, earlier this week and uh, and the book sales are going well and it looks like a fantastic book. I'm looking forward to getting my copy. Mm. Yeah, me too. I haven't uh, read it yet, but I, I uh, realised the other day that it must be either published or just mm. about to publish, so I'll mm. have to check in with her. All right. Well, um, let's talk about the impact you're making in the world. I, I really like, I mean, I found the um, uh, your website, you've got this section, We Believe, and, and I mm. love the beliefs there that you spell out, and particularly the number one, because Having come through the corporate world and, um, you know, been told all through that, oh, our people are our greatest asset, but then they talk about, well, people being an asset. They talk about human, the human resources department. And I love your number one value there, which is human beings are not human resources. They're people. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about the impact you're making in the world. And, and then we'll get dig into those uh, details some more later. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, so I think, to start on. That, um, I mean, I've got a master's in, in human resource management, um, and um, it's, it's, wonderful, it's a wonderful thing. But um, a mindset of seeing you know, human beings as resources, um, which, you know, that obviously that title suggests is the case, um, can dehumanise workplaces. And so... Um, what we're about is creating a world where people can really bring their humanity to work. And that's really good for the people and I think it's really good for the organisation as well. And the world, I think, is becoming um, potentially increasingly dehumanised, um, particularly now with uh, AI coming on board and um, with uh, margin pressures. Um, it's getting more done with less, uh, more efficiently, and so... Uh, in many ways, we're sort of almost going back to the Fred Taylor times of uh, scientific management and just um, cogs in the machine. And, and I know just from my consulting that people do feel like, um, you know, they're, they're in many cases a number and a resource and, um, you know, and, and they, of course, we're all not that. We're all people. And if we can bring our authentic selves to work, uh, we get a lot more pleasure out of what we do. Importantly for the organisation, we can relax and become who we really are um, and that frees our psyche up to do more creative things uh, and organisations are going to benefit from that. Mm, yeah, I really like that and, and particularly the idea of, of relaxing because you don't have to maintain this um, facade or, or persona that, that somebody else is expecting of you, whether whether it's corporate environment we're in or whether it's mm. just the belief that we have that that's what's expected mm. well that, that's right i remember you know early on my dad had a small business and i can remember at a young age hearing the term um you know it's just business or business is business mm. which is almost a um you know a license to um to do something that you might not otherwise want to do where you wouldn't normally do as a, as a human as a nice person you know it's just business so you you cut yeah. the thrust and you um you know, that gives you license to, to not be a human, perhaps not be all human. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, where, where that uh, expression, I mean, I know from my corporate days, there was always this belief that, um, you know, you leave your personality, or mm. uh, you leave your personal stuff at home. And often it was you left your personality at home as well. Mm. But the, um, where that term, oh, it's just business often mm. comes up these days is in, in the, uh, crime movies where the crime syndicates kind of you know bump each other off to mm. get to the top of the tree and they say sorry i'm going to kill i'm going to kill you but it's not personal <laughs> <laughs> that's right yeah that's that's uh, life in the jungle yeah <laughs> but look in my consulting yeah. experiences i've seen i've seen the power of, of um of the human approach to leadership um yeah um did a a review an organizational review on a a government department which uh, had been up, there was a, actually a parliamentary 
uh, investigation, a committee formed that investigated um, the bullying culture of this organisation. And uh, I went in there with uh, my colleague to run um, some focus groups. We ran 14 focus groups for staff from that organisation. And um, it was a. I was expecting a really um, negative experience, but as luck would have it, a new CEO had joined the organisation eight weeks before we arrived to do our focus groups. And people were really positive, and they were talking about um, the, the CEO's Friday email. And um, I've seen some CEO Friday emails that pretty much get put straight into the delete. You know, the delete button hovers over them, and they get put in the bin. But some um, people seem to be really you know, interested in these emails. So we asked to get copies of these emails. And this new CEO had an absolutely human approach to, to business. Um, and he set up a ask the CEO um, email address. So if there are any rumors going around, you just sent the CEO an email. But this weekly email um, had photos of the CEO um, with, I remember one of them was, uh, was the dog lying, you know, in the, in the Sunday morning sun, um, mm -hmm. lying, and with the caption one was, you know, here's, here's, uh, Sandy lying on the board papers, um, enjoying the sunshine. So you've got a bit of an insight into this CEO, you know, he's got a dog, and another photo was him and his kids at the football. So he's got children, he's got a dog, and he just told it how it was. He just acted like, you know, a normal human being. And people absolutely warmed to that, and they were really positive, despite having, years of this oppressive uh, culture, bullying culture, they were really looking forward to the future with this new CEO. And, and all the CEO did was become human, or it was, was to allow his humanity to shine through. And that was um, a real eye-opener to me, that the power of, of, um, of being your authentic self, which this person was, and turned the culture mm -hmm. around. I mean, people talk about culture taking years to, to, uh, to shift. Yeah, yeah. Um, but... There, I think there's a that really brought for me into focus the difference between culture and climate, and and certainly culture you know apparently does take a long time to change. Well, that's the general agreed assumption it seems, um, but the climate can change in an instant. We all know that you know we're if we're uh, at home and uh, the door opens and uh, you know our beloved other walks in in a good mood or a foul mood, the climate can change. You know, in a second, or you know, if if the kids come home from school or wherever they are, you know, in a grumpy mood or a good mood, the the climate of that you know of the house can change in an instant. So, so whether you you know, we can get stuck on semantics, but um, but certainly the uh, the power of being human has an instant can have an instantaneous impact on a workplace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great story, and one one of the I mean, for me. Changing culture, yeah, that's a that's a big one because it comes back to beliefs and general behaviours. But you know, you've got to start somewhere, and I think that's a great place to start. And then it's a case of building habits around that. Mm -hmm. Now, why do you think why do you think a lot of people in in very senior roles can't make that change or can't kind of show that level of humanity? Mm, it's a tough one. Um, they might have a uh, a lot of senior. I think people lower down in the organisation look to the leader and think, well, the leader you know, can call all the shots. But more often than not, the leaders got bosses themselves. You know, it might be the mm. the board, the chairman of the board, or whatever it might be. So the CEO might appear to have lots of um, jurisdictional freedom, but that may not be the case. There might be. Um, um, you know, compliance considerations, uh, there's all sorts of, you know, the, the, um, the legal advice, the legal department would be whispering in many CEOs ears, you know, what to say and not to say. Um, and it, it, it would take a brave leader in some respects to, uh, just, just to fess up and be, be real. But I think, look, I think in, in many cases too, it's just, the game that we all seem to think we've got to play. Like the further you go up the chain, the more impact your words have. Therefore, I better be careful what I say. Therefore, I better not deviate from the script. And it mm. becomes, that's the start of be, becoming a mechanistic organization. So, you know, subliminally people then know, okay, uh, there's a strong compliance issue here. 
Um, so part of one of the unwritten ground rules is um, to toe the line and not step out of line. And when the leader can sort of re-examine that, the, the value in that mechanistic approach might um, it might keep them clean from the legal department's point of view. But what's that doing to the culture of the organisation? Um, Margaret Wheatley's got a great saying: "Proceed until apprehended." And um, you know, if you if if you're the CEO and you you want to shake things up a bit, it might be interesting to go. Okay, well, I know that culturally, I probably should you know, be on a certain train track, but if I want to do my own thing, let's you know, as the CEO did that I mentioned before. You know, he came into an organisation which was on a particular train track, and he derailed it um, innocently, perhaps, um, and beautifully, um, just by being himself. Um, so quite often the case, um, you know, I guess that, that, that old um, story of, of the uh, elephant, you know, you can, you can contain an elephant by tying a piece of rope around its leg with a, held, held by a light stick because young elephants, when they're born, they get a chain put around their, you probably heard this analogy, yeah, so they get the, the chain and a, and a heavy peg and they can't pull against it and then when they get bigger they just think there's no point in trying to change things here and so just a light a light rope will do and uh, I suspect that many of us in organizations suffer from that same that same uh, false assumption yeah yeah that's right it's it I was going to say before and ask that you know a lot of a lot of those constraints are perhaps self not self-imposed, but we kind of think they're still there when perhaps they're mm. not. So that elephant analogy is a great one, yeah. Mm. Mm. One of the things I'm curious about and uh, to get your view on, uh, and it's around, you know, many industries um, have pretty tight procedures around safety and compliance and, and various other things depending on what industry they're in. And then also you have like even in, in my business, you know, we have standard procedures that we keep revising for best practice, but we say, well, this is best practice as we know it. So mm. here's how we do these specific things. So how do you balance that with kind of allowing people the freedom to bring their own personality, their own uh, ideas, their own um, innovative experimentation and curiosity to those mm. to the way we do business as well? Yeah, that is the um, that is the real dilemma, isn't it? It's a real dichotomy. How do you give people freedom, and how do you get people to follow a process? Um, because that, you know, by inference, is restricting their their freedom. Um, mm. I can remember I saw um, Stephen Covey at the Opera House many years ago, and he was talking about this particular issue. You know, it's um, human creativity and innovation. Um, it's about you know taking the, the boundaries down and Letting people roam free, um, but he made the point. You know, many of you might have uh, come into Sydney via an aeroplane, and um, how innovative would you want your pilots to be this morning <laughs> yeah. when, you, when you landed? Would you want them to be following the procedure, or would you want them to be you know, being pretty creative? So I think there's a time and a place for everything. Um, and if you take aviation as an example, there's got to be some pretty creative thinking happen when you're. Uh, when you, you know, when you're on the flight deck of a, an air, airliner, uh, and even in the cabin for that matter, you've got to deal with many, many unexpected things, but you also have to deal with many things that are predictable and that are routine. Um, the, the chef in the, in the restaurant's another one. I mean, the, the chef wants to have, you know, some creative license to add some pizzazz to the meal. Um, but the chef probably wants, you know, the Himalayan rock salt to be put back in the same place every time and wants the orders to come into the kitchen in the same way uh, and uh, the front of house to operate in, in a certain you know, set of procedures so that that then enables, that that takes care of, that gives order um, to the chaos or potential chaos to mm. enable uh, a creative space. So procedure, process and order actually, uh, if they're good, they l lend themselves to being efficient, which then... Um, provides some some space for that creative thinking and and why not have you know if you if you want to have a procedure if you've got a procedure that that some um, needs some creativity you have your flowchart going along that line as we've all probably seen them on paper 
Um, and then, uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, we do this and then that and then this and then that. And then there's a box, you know, we, we, um, allow creativity to blossom or we, uh, we have a discussion or we have a whiteboard exercise or we do, you know, that, that's a, there's a creativity space within that particular procedure. So I don't think that they are diametrically opposed. Um, and in my view, having a procedure, they've got to be good procedures and that's a big issue. Um, mm. but, um, but if the procedure can actually create the space for creativity and innovation. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a really important point. And I think, you know, you mentioned earlier about uh, automation and technology and AI that's around now and that um, we, we're sort of at risk of losing some humanity there um, if we abdicate to that. And I certainly talk a lot in, in the marketing space about let's make marketing human again and start with mm. building relationships rather than abdicating to these fabulous tools that are around where you can automate emails, you can automate um, people signing in and following up and all that kind of stuff. My mm. philosophy is that all those tools, um, I mean, I think a lot of those tools are really wonderful, but I think that they need to be used in a way that here's all the mechanical rope repetitive stuff that we do that takes our time Let's use the tools to do that bit mm. and then let's free up our time to actually interact and and mm. you know, work on the relationship part because that's the bit we mm. aren't really mm. – I and mean, that gets dehumanised if we automate that. Absolutely, yeah. And how important are relationships? I've just been uh, – work. just yesterday was running a workshop, people who work in the disaster management world, and uh, they made the point that um, – Effective uh, response you know, in a disaster or a crisis really relies on the relationships that you built previously. If you've got those relationships in place, um, then you, you can bark out some quick orders. You can make some quick calls, uh, and and uh, if you've got relationships with people, that works really well. If you haven't got those relationships, uh, things can fall off off the bus pretty quickly. Mm. Yeah, and it's uh, communication. I mean, communication is critical, but in that scenario, extremely critical. And, and so any potential for misunderstanding of communication, which usually comes back to, you know, there's not a good relationship there or not a good understanding of when this person says A, that they actually mean A and not B, um, that's, that, um, is a potential for mm. further disaster. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. The mis the misinterpretation of um, you know, of the word of the of the written or spoken word can be catastrophic, as the aviation industry knows only too well. The worst um, aviation disaster in history to this point: um, five hundred eighty three people lost their lives um, when two seven four seven jumbos collided, one taking off and one taxiing back, and um, and there are a number of uh, Contributing factors to that, not least of which was the misunderstanding of the term, one term, the term takeoff, the air traffic controller used. Um, so yeah, the, and, and we all do, um, have our own interpretation of, um, of the word. I mean, the, just the word innovation. Um, what does that mean? What does that mean to you? And what does it mean to me? The term of, uh, leadership, you know, and good leadership, um, yesterday, um, the group I was working with said effective leadership is really important. Okay, so what does effective leadership look like? And uh, there was very diverse views on that. So if you let that one go through to the keeper, everyone's agreeing effective leadership is important. Mm. But um, all of us will have a slightly different video playing in our heads as to what that might look like. Mm. Yeah, that's a really great point because, you know, we tend to, I mean, we have this picture in our mind, whether it's leadership or um, innovation, mm. and there's usually a whole story and a whole set of beliefs and values that underpin what we understand as individuals by those things. Mm. And yet we nominalize the whole lot into one or two words. And, mm. and then we expect the other person to understand all those values and um, beliefs mm. and behaviors that we attribute to that one word. Yeah, exactly. Mm. It's quite amazing that uh, humans actually do achieve <laughs> some element of communication. I mean, yeah. someone, someone clever said um, that the problem with communication is the illusion that has been achieved. 
or something mm. along those lines. Yeah. yeah. So you and I having a conversation, then I I walk away thinking you've heard and understood within the context of me everything that I've said and and vice versa. And it's quite unlikely that that's actually happened. That's right. Yeah. Well, I I learned that lesson very hard because this is just in one language, and then you know you go to different languages, different cultures, different religions, different backgrounds, mm. um, different, yeah, you know, you know, mm. other, all the other differences that, that are around with people throughout the globe. And then all of a mm. sudden you, you realize that, Hey, I'm, I've said, can we do X? And the other person said, Oh, yeah, we can do that. And, um, you know, X is not really going to happen because we haven't really, we haven't really worked out exactly what that means and made sure that it transcends all those differences that, that um, we have. Mm, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's a real challenge. Yeah. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, some years ago I was um, facilitating a, a group um, of board members and, um, and the, the term customer, no, sorry, consumer, the term consumer came up. It was about um, you know, working with consumers and one member really had an issue with the term consumer, um, and their um, their ethnic background consumer meant something different to the context that the other members were were uh, using the term in. And um, consumer was sort of like this greedy person who was just consuming everything. Mm. So it really um, it really uh, caused a bit of an issue that had to be had to resolve that different understanding before the conversation could continue constructively. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, now I want to touch on, on your book and some of the messages mm. out of that. So human factors. Um, and you gave an example earlier about, in, or you gave a couple of examples actually about aircraft mm. industry, which is, uh, your background and where some of this, um, some of this information that's in the book came from. So let's start off with, you know, you talk about human factors thinking. So what is human factors thinking? Human factors thinking uh, is based on a couple of key principles. One, one key, I think the biggest key principle is that all humans are fallible. Hmm. Um, but, and we sort of know that. I mean, if, uh, you know, we see politicians and sports people every week on TV um, you know, lamenting what they've done and and saying, look, I'm you know, I'm just human. So uh, you know, to 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 err is to be human. So we know that on one level. Um, so, but yeah, so human fallibility is a is a critical principle of human factors. And the unfortunate reality is, we understand that we're fall we're fallible, but um, we don't recognize our fallibility until after the event um, so something will go wrong and we go oh okay I, I misunderstood you I had some other assumption or I forgot or whatever I mean you you don't realize you're fallible until you you actually do close the front door and then later on find out that the keys are still inside hmm. so human fallibility is uh, is, a, is a sort of foundation principle of human factors um, another um, I guess um, companion of that is that errors are inevitable, um, and another follow-on is that errors can be managed. So, if you have certain systems and procedures in place, you can contain errors, you can avoid them, you can trap them, or you can mitigate um, errors that do occur. So, um, the aviation industry and other industries similar to that, your high-risk industry, the, the nuclear. Um, Power production industry, for example, um, medicine, um, maritime industry, mining, uh, all of those industries that are high risk industries, uh, recognize that errors do occur and they have, um, um, arrangements and systems and procedures in place to reduce those errors. Some industries more than others have got a people, uh, centric focus to that and others have got a system centric fo focus. Aviation adopt, has adopted over the last 40 years a very much a systems model to uh, countering errors. And I, I term it errorism. Uh, errorism is the propensity for humans to make errors, make mistakes. So to counter errorism, um, you can focus on the person who's made the error, the error maker, or you can focus on the system. 
aviation focuses on the system, recognising that if one person can make that error, then surely another person can as well. So you actually have error-prone situations rather than error-prone people. Um, and one of the... I, I heard um, at a conference once a, a Southwest Airlines pilot describe it as, um, as errors are like marbles in a bowl. Um, and if you want to contain the errors, you've got to make the size of the bowl higher. Rather than lamenting the fact that you know marbles are falling out of the bowl, you just have to make those sides of the bowl high. And that's a systems, you know, an analogy, I guess, or a vision of a systems-based approach to to errorism. So, I mean, for, I guess a, you know, an example would be if um, if you've got an extension lead across the doorway, um, and uh, I walk through and trip on the extension lead, a people-focused um, approach to errorism would be to uh, to have a good serious chat to me and tell me that I should be mm. more careful in future and you know don't know, I should be looking where I'm going and all you know all sorts of things and we might put some signs up on the wall please you know don't trip over the cord um, I might do some training on mindfulness while walking or something um, that's just you know a, a, I guess a bit of a ridiculous example of a system yeah, yeah. A, a person approach centered approach um, whereas a system centered approach would go okay well, this, this is an error-prone situation. How can we deal with it? And that's what aviation does. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, that, that it's the example you gave there is kind of black and white, I guess, but mm. if I'm thinking of in the aviation industry, there's lots of complex processes and procedures that need to happen with lots of moving parts and lots of, mm. um, lots of, people involved and lots of communication as we talked before that has to happen that has to be exactly right so that everybody knows um this is what's expected now um mm. the 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 component of then training people in how those systems work and how they have to be and behave within that system is that is that still part of the system's thinking or does that kind of come into the human aspects of it well, the human factors thinking component, uh, yeah, if you take that through, so um, human fallibility is a fundamental principle. Errors are going to happen, uh, but errors can be can be addressed. They can be contained. They can be uh, avoided or trapped. Now, part of that uh, is is adopting focusing on two key areas. One, of course, is the procedures and systems element. So you have these procedures in place that you know hopefully are safe. And all. the other important one is developing a psychologically safe climate. And that's where aviation has done a lot of work over, over the years. Because, and that, that's actually part of the system, it's part of the human factors thinking, um, to get the, make the best use of all available resources means having people who feel comfortable enough to speak up if they can foresee an error, uh, situation, uh, eventuating. And um, unfortunately, over the years, there's been many an accident report, accident investigation, aircraft accident investigation report that indicated that you had, you know, a, a captain oblivious to the danger of, that the aircraft was getting itself in, and a and a first officer co-pilot sitting there, fully aware of what may well be transpiring, and uh, but not feeling like they can say too much, or if they do say something, they're probably not going to be listened to. So the hierarchy in the cockpit, just like a hierarchy in organisations, means that the person at the top uh, could believe themselves to be the all-seeing, all-knowing, all-doing person. Um, and if that mindset prevails, um, if, the, if they make excellent calls all of the time, then we're fine. But if they don't see something one day, uh, if they're distracted doing something else, else um, if their perception is off for whatever reason, um, if you've got a psychologically safe workplace where the other person or other people around them can see something that they're not comfortable with, um, then then they speak up. And that aviation has spent a lot of time and effort running what they call crew resource management programs, and they are compulsory programs for flight crew, and that's now been extended into other areas, um, air traffic control and ground-based um, aviation personnel as well. But every year, um, it's part of the um, uh, international requirements for uh, for having a commercial license to operate. Every year, a commercial um, airline has to put their 
uh, their flight crew through one or two days of uh, human factors training. Um, and that essentially um, is getting crusty old captains uh, to recognise that they're, they're fallible like everyone else and, um, and they are obligated to create a workplace climate you know, in that, in, on, on that flight deck uh, and and now um, you, you see many examples. I've seen many examples now where at the pre-flight briefing, uh, the captain will say, "Okay, we're going from here to there." They talk about all those issues, and then they will say something along the lines of, "Now I'm um, I'm not perfect. I'll make mistakes. If you see me doing something you're not happy with, I expect you to tell me." Um, and whilst researching the book, I talked to a number of aircraft captains, and they all had that very similar line. In the old days, of course, it was all personality driven. Some captains might have, and some might not have. Um, but now it's actually part of, ironically, part of the system uh, yeah. that there's an expectation for the captain to share the load, um, be absolutely transparent in their communication, engage people in decision making, um, ensure that everyone's got a shared situational awareness. It's actually part of um, that humanness. Uh, has been proceduralized, which um, is in some ways ironic, but it, it is allowing, you know, that's allowing people to work in a psychologically safe environment, which means if they do see something that's not right, they're very quick to point it out. And the person who has made the mistake is very quick to say, okay, right, thank you, rather than, you know, uh, mm. admonish them. So that's a huge mindset shift. And that's happened over a number of years and it's happened, happened through dedicated training uh, and that training um, really looks at mindset and the assumptions and procedures that that come from a changed mindset mm. yeah it is but you know you said it's kind of ironic that it's a systems approach that that's brought about kind of a change of human behavior but in in a way it just highlights that that's all really interconnected and, mm. and the key the key thing for me though there is the, is that mindset shift because i think part of it is um you know if i'm the pilot and i've got i don't know 30 years of flying experience by the time i get to be a, a senior pilot and um i'm i'm in charge of a um a, what's the big one the big boeing a380 or the a380 yeah, or a380, the, yeah, or the, the, yeah or the, 600 or 800 passengers yeah mm. and um uh so i might have a, a pretty pretty big ego you know and if somebody mm. says hey um you're not you're not doing that right or or you're overlooking this thing here um you know i've got to step my ego aside right absolutely that's a, and that's mm. been the huge issue i mean i went to a conference once and the keynote speaker opened the address um by saying uh how do you know there's a pilot in the room and the answer is, well, they will tell you. Uh, and, <laughs> and the next question is, how do you know there's a surgeon in the room? And the answer is, they'd expect you to know that already. So yeah. that just, and everyone had a chuckle, but that goes to show that ego plays a big part in, you know, some industries. And um, if mm. you're a surgeon or if you're a pilot, um, they're very socially acceptable professions, um, both of, of which hold people's lives in their hands at some point. And um, and so it's very easy to become uh, a bit uh, obsessed with yourself and, and your infallibility. Mm. Um, what aviation has done, though, as part of this crew resource management uh, training, they really changed the height. They, they flattened the hierarchy in the cockpit really simply by bringing in a concept called monitoring. And monitoring is as important as flying because you'll have, you know, on a, any larger aircraft, you're going to have at least two pilots on the flight deck, possibly more, um, and you've got one person flying the aircraft. In fact, you've probably got um, the flight management system and autopilot flying the aircraft for the majority of the time, but, but you've got one person manipulating the flight management system or hand flying the aircraft. And what are the other people doing? Um, they've, an aviation has systematized this concept of monitoring. So nowadays we have a pilot flying on the flight deck and we have a pilot monitoring. And sometimes the captain is the pilot monitoring and sometimes they're the pilot flying. In the old days, they were always the pilot flying, making all the decisions and doing everything. But um, aviation has changed that now to have a pilot flying and a pilot monitoring. And that changes the whole mindset because a pilot monitoring has got a really important job to do and the pilot monitoring will say to the pilot flying, um, no, air traffic control set at 6,000 feet, not 8,000 feet. Or something. Oh, okay. And so they're used now 
and they expect now the pilot monitoring to be tracking everything the pilot flying is doing um, to avoid you know, um, avoidable mistakes. Um, but yeah, that concept, imagine taking that concept to uh, to you and your uh, partner driving the car um, <laughs> and and you're driving and the person sitting yeah. next to you is going, oh, look out, there's a truck, look out, there's a dog, look out, there's a, there's a yeah. pedestrian crossing. And uh, the, the easy reaction is, you know, you know, just be quiet. I'm, you know, backseat driver. There'd be there'd be a different dynamic in that situation that we'd be probably all familiar with. But in the aviation world now, that dynamic has completely changed. Mm. And if the if the pilot monitoring um, identifies something that's not right, the pilot flying is very grateful for that um, avoidance of what could could turn out to be a catastrophe. Mm. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. As you say, the, the the system from from the aircraft doesn't necessarily translate into other into other environments, but there might be lessons to learn from that. Like, um, for example, in in that uh, driving with your partner example, I mean, if I'm looking for a place to go now in today's world, we've got GPS and and that can talk to us and tell mm. us to turn left at the next intersection but uh, in the olden days before gps you'd be sort of fumbling around for maps or something like that mm. and you'd be distracted mm. from the driving so if you you know if you were assigned roles there and said well you you, you guide me then mm. it's the yeah. same kind of principle isn't it it is yeah and i, I remember one of the early uh, tv ads for uh for uh, one of those gps systems um made the claim that this is you know Avoid, avoiding family arguments or something like X number of percent for that very reason. But look, I don't know about you, but even even with the GPS on, I've still taken the wrong turn, and it, oh, yeah. is, it would be really handy if if uh, you know the pilot monitoring uh, would say, no, it's not this turn, it's the next one. You know, um, or or the other day, I mean, this is an example of human fallibility. Um, I had a workshop to run. Um, I, I'd I'd met with a client many times before. The workshop was at another location. I got in the car with my head full of now what's going to happen to this workshop and what will I do there and, and running through on my mind. Um, and then realized I was driving to their office rather than to the, <laughs> to the venue where I was supposed to be running the workshop. Um, luckily I recognized it early, but you know, if you had the pilot monitoring with me, I was on my own at the time, but if I had the pilot monitoring, the pilot monitoring saying would, would undoubtedly say, why are you turning here? Aren't we going to, you know, this other mm. location? So yeah. But but it does take that mindset shift, and that's what um, aviation has done really really well. And maritime too, I'd have to say they're they're um, going well now. In the case of medicine, they're st I think they're still struggling. Medicine has really taken human factors um, by the horns. They are there's more research happening in human factors in the area of human factors by a medical fraternity than anyone else at the moment. But you've got this well entrenched hierarchy in the in the uh, health system. And um, there's many examples where the uh, you know the nurse in theatre can see the surgeon doing something that the surgeon shouldn't, but not really being sure how to broach the subject, just because of a whole range of cultural issues. And you mentioned before that issue of um, you know it's a bit ironic that you're sort of systematising uh, the human element. Well, I guess the, the the fact of trying to create a specific culture in an organisation is doing that anyway. You know, if you're trying to create a culture of whatever it might be, you're systematizing the human element within the organization. Mm. Yeah, that's true. And, uh, you know, in, in some ways, I mean, for me, the culture is kind of the, the set of behaviors that are expected, the set of behaviors that are not accepted. I mean, the, the baseline is, you know, what, what are you prepared to accept that's unwritten behavior? And, um, if, if there's mm. anything there that is against your own set of values or principles, then basically you're building a broken culture. That's true. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a um, and that's a difficult one because there's of course no black and white in that. Mm. But right. My experience has been um, you know, consulting and in fact working in large organisations myself is um. There's quite often not really a clear blueprint of what the culture mm. uh, is destined to be, or, or the, the apparent, you know, the, uh, the senior leaders don't have a shared vision of the culture that they're trying to develop. It just sort of happens. And you know, I, in the book, I use the analogy of um, 
you know, a river, it sort of just happens over time. The river finds its course along the way, taking the easiest path around, mm. you know, this boulder and, and, and that mountainside. And then, um, you know, over the years, leaders end up following that same river's path. Um, but with, without, you know, without a necessarily having a clear idea of where they want to take the culture. So, and it becomes entrenched and strong and, and the leader gets wrapped up with it as much as the rest of the organization. But, um, having a discussion at the senior leader level, what culture do we, do we want to develop? And the point you raised earlier about, um, you know, words have different uh, connotations and meanings. Uh, if you have a group of people talking about what culture they want to develop, you know, we want to be, um, uh, gregarious or we, we want to be all embracing or, um, we want to be uh, collaborative. All of those words are very common. We all nod our heads, um, you know, knowingly. Probably all of us have got different views of what you know, collaborative looks like, sounds like, and feels like. So, you know, having the discussion about what does the culture, what culture we want to build, let alone building it, just even agreeing on that, you know, is a challenge in itself. But um, mm, that's what, that's you know, that's right, what yeah. progressive organisations yeah. have got to get right. Yeah, it is a learning journey, isn't it? Because the other thing about some of those words are, you know, when you, like I've been in situations where we've talked in, in you know, my corporate days, we've talked as an organization or as a group about culture or about values and terms like that are brought up. And often I wonder if, you know, people bring a term like that up because uh, inclusive or uh, mm. shared values or something like that, whether it's what they expect that should come up or what's right, mm. this is mm. right, um, right, as opposed to, you know, I really strongly feel that this is what we should be doing and here's what it means to me. Mm. Absolutely. And that's, that's bringing humanity to work. That's, mm. you know, that, that's being real to yourself and to your work colleagues. And when you do that, you know, as this CEO I mentioned earlier on, when when that happens, you open up a a little valve somewhere, you know, in in the dam wall, and some beautiful things can happen as a result of that. And some of it's, you know, potentially um, not that comfortable. Any organisation, a successful organisation, uh, now would know that um, that uh, you have to be comfortable with with some disagreement. Um, otherwise, and that's that's where innovation you really uh, can, can really uh, prosper. Um, there's a, a young woman from uh, Canberra who's now travelling the world, uh, Julia Da, who's actually um, done a couple of TED Talks, and um, she's travelling the world talking to organisations about um, how they can make decisions more effectively, and it really is about that, that well, I call it the dialectic approach of decision-making, where you, you crash a couple of ideas together not to, not for one to overpower the other, but to, to create some creative spark out of, out of that fusion of difference. And, um, and Julia talks about, uh, a concept of, um, a, a pre-commitment to the possibility of being wrong. Um, mm. which, which is a fascinating concept, I think, because when you are wrong, you don't know you're wrong until after the event. You know, I, I thought, you know, I thought the, um, cryptocurrencies were going to keep going and now it's dropped 25%. So <laughs> you only know that after the event. Um, yep. so you've got to pre-commit to the possibility of being wrong. And, um, and she advises that, um, that you approach decision making as it's more like a climbing wall rather than a cage fight. And I just love that, uh, concept as well. Mm. Um, and, you know, because idea, ideas do get better, um, through challenge and critique. And uh, if you want to innovate, um, you've got to have a couple of prerequisites. One is, I, I would suggest having a psychologically safe workplace where people can throw ideas out there without fear or favour, um, and you've got to you've got to really approach it with a mindset of, the, of pre-committing to the possibility of being wrong. Mm. Yeah, I love it. Mm. Yeah, well, you've kind of you've kind of transitioned into the next section for me there. I oh, perfect. Still ask the question, um, and and this is the buzz round, and these are the five scripted questions that I ask. Mm. And they're designed to help our audience who are primarily leaders and innovators in their field with some tips from your experience. So I'm, I, I often say that I love to have guests give some really insightful answers that will inspire the listener to go and do something awesome as a result. 
So I think you've probably given us the answer to the first mm. question, which is what's the number one thing anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Yeah, look, I think it is um, that very thing of pre-committing to the possibility of being wrong, i.e. Um, being a humble leader if you're a leader, but being a humble person, recognising that I don't know everything and the concept that I've got might, might have some flaws in it. And, um, and, but it's really good to throw it out there and, and get someone to have a kick and a, or the you know, group of people to have a kick and a punch at it. I remember one of the key, um, events that happened when I was actually before consulting, I was an internal facilitator running a, um, uh, business planning workshop a day, offsite day with a diagonal cross section of an organization. We had about 40 people in the room including the CEO, all the senior executives. It was a legal organisation, so we had a number of lawyers and a few administrators. And we also had the lowest paid person in the organisation who was a storeman. And I thought, what a, that is fantastic that an organisation would have that cross-sectional diagonal, a cross-sectional diagonal of people in the room. And this was back in about 95 or 6, thereabouts. Mm -hmm. And when we were looking at... Um, oh, drinking. Yeah. oh, absolutely. <laughs> When we were looking at um, what the organisation should do, this um, this really lovely young storeman, lowest person, lowest paid person in the organisation, suggested that the organisation uh, develop a thing called a website, and um, and all of the senior execs poo pooed the idea. No, well, no, our, look, our clients um, aren't tech savvy; they're not going to have access to that. So that's um. That's a bit of a waste of time. So next, next idea. Um, and 12 months later, the organization had a website. So the lowest paid person in the organization, you know, um, could see it and, um, all of the top brass couldn't. So, um, that was a real eye opener to me. And we are, we are prisoners of our own experience. Um, we are prisoners of our own perception. And, um, and that means that we can't see it all and we don't see it all. And uh, so the, the secret to innovation for mine is engaging diversity. You know, people talk about it's wonderful having you know, diversity in organisations. Why? Well, the wonderment of diversity in organisations is a whole bunch of people with different ideas and through those different ideas um, you can come up with a, a, a much more um, creative, innovative solution to issues in my view. Yeah, that's great. No, I love the story. I, I'm trying to recall there was another story, but I don't recall the details now, but it was a cleaning lady was in the meeting mm. as well. So it was a similar sort of situation. And yeah. a cleaning cleaning lady asked some question like, you know, she didn't understand why mm. a certain thing was done. And so she asked the, the question that nobody else was going to ask because they all yeah. thought they knew we did this. And she said, why do we do that? And of course, mm. nobody had a nobody had a, a really good answer. And then it turns out that by eliminating whatever that activity was, they ended up saving millions of dollars and and streamlining yeah. that process. So. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. The the innocent, um, ignorant, innocent observer can uh, unknowingly open up a a whole new way of thinking for a, a group of experts. Yeah. Because when you're an expert, you've got this deep level of knowledge. You've got a you know, and and uh, you just get obsessed with that. Um, and, and you really, you admire the problem. You end up admiring the problem rather than, um, than thinking, well, now what do we do about this problem? You just get obsessed with exploring the problem even more. Hmm. Okay. Now, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? The best thing I've done to develop new ideas? Look, I, I think the first thing that comes to mind is writing the book, um, called The Human hmm. Factor. And because, um, it's, it's about, uh, that, point I was just making, it's about um, uh, seeking that, that organisational leaders uh, examine their mindset around what what leadership means and what good leadership means and how you can make the best use of all available resources. And you do that um, by creating psychologically safe workplaces and encouraging people like the lowest paid person in your organisation to uh, come up with a good idea or come up with an idea and throw it on the table. Um, or if, if they can foresee a problem on the horizon, um, having the ability and capacity and, um, capability of, um, of mentioning that. Because, um, after every mammoth disaster, there is always someone who will say, 
I knew that was going to happen. Yeah, that was, yeah that's right. Yeah. Now, that might be some people talking, you know, using their ego, but, but there are often people who knew that was going to happen, and if you ask them, well, why didn't you say something, their response is generally, well, no one asked me. Um, yeah. So well, we no need organisations. Yeah. yeah. So we yeah. need organisations to, to hold a space where people who can see this error, this accident, this, this catastrophe about to unfold, to, uh, to put their hand up and be heard, and that's not easy. Hmm. All right. Um, do you have a favourite resource you use most often? Favourite resource I use most often? Um, I think I do. I do a lot of group facilitation, um, and the favourite resource that I use there, and, and a colleague of mine, I've been facilitating many, many years, but um, a colleague of mine and Catherine's, actually, who you mentioned earlier, um, we were meeting the other day talking about this fascinating concept called facilitation or group facilitation. It's not everyone's cup of tea, but we, we pontificate on it. And, um, and he said, well, as group facilitators, all we do is help people communicate. And I thought, yes, I hadn't actually thought of it like that, but that's what we do as communi- as uh, facilitators. So my favorite tool, I think, is using powerful questions. Mm-hmm. Um, the questions of what, how, and why. And um, another colleague, facilitator colleague of mine told the story once of um, she was with a whole bunch of lawyers and um, she was a facilitator and the lawyers were all talking amongst themselves. So she was very much a hand, apparently a hands-off facilitator and she said she asked one word or one question um, because they came to a bit of a point in the discussion and she just said, why? A one-word question. And then that set them off again, and they <laughs> solved the problem just by yeah. one word. Um, and it looked probably to those there, we've paid this person a whole bunch of money to facilitate, and they didn't do anything. But in fact, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, that's well, uh, they, they that, um, yeah, they're the catalyst to, to make that happen. That's just right. that mm. So my favourite tool are those powerful questions of, um, mm. of why, how, and what. Yeah, yeah, I love it. I, I love to do the... Um, Kind of, I'm kind of being a little bit more sparing in asking why questions these days. Uh, particularly, you know, if you get an answer and you say, "Oh, why?" and then you know, there's mm. a five whys technique yeah. where you can kind of dig deeper and uncover. But I find sometimes people will clam up on that, and I'll say you're trying mm. to be a smart ass because you, mm. you, you know, you're just playing little kid or something. Why, why, why? Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so I tend to do things like, well, what if? What if it was different? Or how does that make you feel? Or how does that work for you? Or mm, how is that mm. a problem? How is that a problem if somebody's talking about mm. you? How is yeah. that a problem? And then, then they kind of often will open up more and, and go sort of wider on whatever the issue yeah. is that we're talking about. Yeah, that's right. If um, Simon Sinek's begin with why or, you know, what, mm. you know, so the why is, you know, knowing the why, that's been, uh, yeah, yeah, that's the, the, the big thing over the last, you know, five or ten years, isn't it? Um, I've, yeah, another way of asking why is um, for what purpose? Yeah, that's another way of saying, as you've pointed out. Um, and another one that I've seen people use is um, I'm I'm seeing it differently. What's the intention? Can you help me understand the intention of that or something? So mm. you don't. Use the the why word, but it gets to the same yeah. point. But but the the I guess with all of those things, it's that that genuine curiosity of wanting to understand. Mm. That's what it's about. So you know the words are a tool for that, and mm. you don't use exactly the right word. It's the intention of curiosity that is really important. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I love it. All right, now what's the best way to keep a client on track? Um, well, I think it's about. Um, being completely open and transparent, um, and and having you know having those regular discussions around what's what's going on, um, so keeping them on track. Who who says what's the track? Um, it would be you know you, you might have a track in your mind, um, and the client's off track, but the uh, the client's track you know in all the tri- client's track and their mind's probably a different track, and and they're on track. Uh, you think they're off track, so it's really about having some uh, some good discussions around what is the track, and why are you there, and why do I think you should be here. So mm. it's really just having those transparent discussions. 
Yeah. I mean, that's yeah, again that uh, whole. Yeah, like it's it's that just having that. Um, you know, I'm I know more than you. I, I know what the mm. track should be and is. Um, you might have agreed the track, but again, you might have had some miscommunication there, and mm. your assumption of the track and theirs might be different. So it's yeah. So jumping on it early, um, not jumping on it, but just having an open, transparent discussion mm. around it early. Yep, love it. Yeah, and making sure that you're both understanding what the track mm. is the same. Yeah. Mm. That's all right. All right, and. Final question, what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Well, we're all unique. Um, I I went up to the Woodford Folk Festival a couple of years ago. I don't know if you've heard of that. Um, fantastic event that happens um, from Boxing Day through to New Year up at uh, a little town called Woodford, north of Brisbane. And um, the opening ceremony, and, and, and you become Woodforians, Wood Fordians at that place, um, where you sign up to a whole cultural experience where everyone's lovely to each other. Um, there's, you know, there's no stealing. There's no, you know, it's everyone's just beautiful to each other. And, uh, the opening ceremony, um, uh, Dr. Yaya said, um, remember, you are unique, just like everyone else. Um, <laughs> which I thought was a beautiful saying. But I think, um, in answer to your question, the fact is that we are unique that we're all humans, we have our own very, very own story. No one else uh, is like us. Uh, and so the the way that we deal with that issue you raised is to just be us and, um, and to open up the floor to all the people so that they are them and can be them and can bring their uniqueness uh, to the table and the innovation flourishes in a very unique way from that point. So, so the, the, the dip being different is about tapping into the, the innate creativity that um, that you and your people have because no one else has got it. Um, mm. You know, no one else can take what you've got and apply it in exactly the same way that you do. So that would be um, my thinking. Yeah. yeah, I love it. And, and recognise that everybody else around you and your teams are also unique and they can contribute and, and actually mm. bring together all of your uniqueness like mm. a unique organisation or team. Or That's right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Fantastic. Just well, like everyone else. This is yeah, just like <laughs> everyone else. Yeah. Thanks. This has been really fabulous. Now, where can people find out more about the work you're doing? Um, get a hold of your book, um, The Human Factor, and maybe even reach out and say thanks for what you've shared. Yeah, you yeah, know, thanks, Jurgen. Um, well, um, the book's available uh, on online, uh, Amazon. It's also on the usual Booktopias and um, and uh, online uh, outlets. You can also purchase a copy of the book from going to the website humansbeingatwork.com.au. So, humans being at work, so a t work, not symbol work. dot com. dot au, and um, there's um, there's a, a prompt there to the human factor, so you can quite directly from uh, from the source. Um, and yeah, get in contact with uh, with us. Uh, I'm graham at humanatwork.com.au and, um, and we'd love to hear from you. And um, yeah, I'd love to have any feedback. If anyone does um, get a copy of the book and have a read, I'd love to. I've had some really lovely feedback from uh, from readers and I'd love to hear some more from people. Great. Well, we'll post that link on the show notes and also a link to the book on Amazon so people can click straight through, check it out and um, get in touch. Mm. All right. Well, do you have any parting advice for our listener today, Graham? Well, I, I just think Dr. Yaya says it all. I think um, <laughs> just, just, yeah, just, just embrace your humanness, um, your uniqueness uh, and, uh, yeah, and go forth and give and live. Mm. Love it. All right, and finally, who else should I get on the show and why? Oh, who else? Gee. Um, oh, dear. There's a uh, colleague of mine, Stephen Barclay, who uh, he spent 13 years in India. Uh, he's mm -hmm. he's a, a values consultant. Um, and so from an innovation my, um, standpoint, uh you know, values are playing to that. So uh, Stephen Barkley might be someone uh, who, who you might enjoy chatting with. Okay. Well, we'll get introduced to Stephen mm. by you and um, reach yeah. out to him and see if we can get him on the show as well. Sounds fascinating. Absolutely. 
All right. Well, thanks very much, Graham, for sharing your time and your insights so generously today. I've really enjoyed this and uh, learnt a lot more behind what inspired you to write the book and how some of the um, examples from the um, the airline industry background that that you have mm. kind of play in play into general general business and general um, companies and and how that can transform our team so that we can be much more innovative. So thanks mm. for all that and all the best for the future and let's stay in touch. Thanks, Jürgen. Lovely talking with you. Appreciate it. Bye. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed that insightful and valuable conversation with Graham and took something away from his episode. Now, there was certainly a lot of fascinating information and conversation around the humanness of leadership, setting aside ego in the interests of innovation and new solutions, as well as robust processes to ensure that we can adapt to changing situations effectively. I'd love to know what you took away from Graham's episode. Please leave a comment below the blog post, which you can find at innovabiz.co forward slash Graham Miller. That is G-R-A-H-A-M. M-I-L-L-E-R, all lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Graham Miller. You'll also find contact information for getting in touch with Graham there, as well as links to the Humans Being at Work website, his social media pages, his book, and the other resources we spoke about in the conversation today. Now, if you like this episode, please share it with two other people that it might help. You'll be doing them a massive service and tag me in on that share so that I can thank you with a special surprise gift. Graham suggested that we have a conversation with Values Consultant Stephen Barclay on a future Innova Buzz podcast episode. So Stephen, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast courtesy of Graham Miller. Tune in again to the next episodes of the Innova Buzz podcast. We've got yet more fantastic guests lined up, including Rahul Alim of Custom Creatives and leadership coach Iggy Perillo. Thanks for listening to this episode. Make sure you subscribe to the show to be reminded of new episodes. It's free to subscribe. Leave a review if you like. Even if you don't like me, I'm okay with that. I'm asking you to leave a review because it helps other people find this show. Go to innovabiz.co to join our marketing transformation community and access a free gift my team and I made for you. It's the Marketing Master Mini Class. We want to give you everything you need to transform your marketing into a human-centered, relationship-focused growth engine. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz. Remember... Be awesome and keep innovating.